We'll talk a little bit about the boomers here in a moment and the kinds of people I block and some more. This one will be a good one. I'm almost certain of it. Um, we'll wait until a few more people show up, but <clears throat> you go to scotthambrick.com and follow me there. I'll put, I'll put the audio of this, if I can capture it and don't have any mistakes, I'll put the audio of this out as a Scott Stream podcast as well. You can see it. Uh, you'll find it at iTunes and Spotify and all that stuff. Hello, Otter Skin, Enix, Henri, Ben. Hello, guys. Um, who's your barbell? Hello. Who, who's your barbell? Yeah, so just a, just a few moments ago, I I blocked uh, another I blocked another user. Um, I posted about. The marital debt. I had a baby boomer. Uh, I said that uh, on my Instagram stories, I've been doing a bunch of stories about um, about boomers and uh, the boomer boomerisms. And um, of course, boomers think that what they believe is true. Uh, so I, I I posted in there that uh, the somebody said that boomers say that the wife. Uh, one of the things that boomers told them that was false is that the wife should always be available to please the husband. And I actually said, well, that's true. It's called the marital debt. And somebody, uh, this boomer said, gag. That was their DM to me. <clears throat> and I said, no, if the vow is exclusivity, neither can deny the other intimacy, since there's no other place to obtain that intimacy. You know, if you go get intimacy somewhere else, you're violating your marriage vows. You can't do that. Um, so we have a we, we, you know, we have a promise to provide for the, all the, for each other's needs when we get married. Uh, and then I said, also, withholding intimacy can lead to using intimacy as a weapon. We all know women that like, oh, well, you know, you're, you know, they'll have a little disagreement at a dinner party, and the wife will say, well, you're not getting any tonight. No, he should. She shouldn't. She she shouldn't say that or do that. We don't withhold intimacy. There's a it is also incumbent on us to not make unreasonable requests for intimacy also like in public when somebody's ill and so on but of course these people don't get it um, <clears throat> I had a guy then I had a guy then just recently recently he said oh so what you're saying is that consent doesn't matter well that's not what I said <clears throat> When you're married, you don't get to withdraw consent. That's the point. It's not that you're advocating for uh, people to ignore consent. If, if a woman does not consent in the marriage, that needs to be respected. But she also needs to know, or he, needs to know that there will be consequences for that. And the consequences for that is that a need for intimacy uh, has been rejected. Doing that repeatedly will lead to resentment and uh, ultimately dissolution of the marriage. If you look at a plot of <clears throat> female hormone levels, sex hormone levels throughout the course of a month, you'll see that there are only a couple of days a month that women are really <clears throat> going to be very interested in sex. <clears throat> Men and women don't have a don't don't have drives that match in that respect. So, you know, what are you to do? What are you to do? Well, the concept of the marital debt fixes that. Of course, modern people just can't they can't get past the idea that the woman can can revoke consent at any moment. And uh, You know, she can revoke it, but there are consequences for that. There are consequences for trying to maintain some sort of a happy marriage when a woman uh, revokes consent because uh, you know, she didn't like a joke that you made at a dinner party. Uh, Eric says, "What you are saying is precisely why I feel our marriage is strong. Can't believe it's controversial." Yeah, it's it is controversial. Um, 
and it's not, you know, and it's not a coincidence that divorce rates are so blasted high. Yeah, it's not. It's 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 ridiculous. So so this guy, he actually his username on Instagram had a uh, Star Wars reference in it. Uh, he lived in Seattle, and he did one of these. So what you're saying is, anytime somebody says in my comments or DMs, so what you're saying is, everything after that is going to be a complete fabrication and complete bullshit. And I blocked him. I don't need to deal with stupid, stupid moderns who can't understand these ideas. I also then went scrolled down through his, his, um, uh, you know, his, I don't know, his wall or whatever the fuck you call it here. <clears throat> and you know, he's he's married. He's he's dating or married or living with or something, you know, some, you know, t tattooed broad with like irony glasses and all that you know I, i'm not here to talk to that guy he's he's lost so i blocked him so you know if you're a if you uh you know if you take great issue with these things i say you know beat it get out of here um it's not i'm not for you you know go over there and you know ask politely you know for your your uh girlfriend because you're not going to be married right i ask politely you know, may we please have sex tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. and then get rejected and just, you know, enjoy that. Just enjoy that and don't try to come over here and convince me. I'm the one that's been married for 25 years and got millions of dollars in the bank. And, you know, everything's fine with me. Don't try to convince me. You know, whatever. But, uh, you know, Stupid moderns projecting are going to get, are going to get, uh, they're going to get blocked. I mean, I, I just, I just don't need it. So, uh, I had a, did a fun little thing on Instagram last night. I was laying in bed and I was just thinking about a young friend that recently got engaged to be married, and they had a bridal shower. And my wife went to the bridal shower, and she told me that a great number of young men went to the bridal shower and I was like why would they even want to go it's inexplicable to me that a young man would want to go to a bridal shower <clears throat> I didn't even want to go to my own wife's bridal shower I showed up at the end I thanked everybody for coming I loaded the gifts in the car and told everybody thank you and left and I didn't even want to do that but I did it because it's the right thing to do I, so anyway, I was thinking about that, so I posted a number of uh, questions here. I said, uh, one, is it a bridal shower or wedding shower? Well, it's a bridal shower, and 72% of you agreed with that. <laughs> and then I asked, should men attend baby showers? And uh, I don't know what that came out to, but the answer to that is no, they should not. Um, I asked, since you now know it's rightly called a bridal shower, should men attend? 7% said yes. How about that? Ain't that a deal? Who said yes? I should name them. Oh, a boomer lady did. A boomer lady said that should said that uh, men should attend baby showers. She's wrong. She's wrong. It's so stupid. You know, if you're gonna have a baby shower, you're pregnant, and you're uh, one of your your mother-in-law, your sister-in-law. Your sister throws you a baby shower and you go, there are going to be other women show up and they're going to talk about baby stuff. They're going to talk about pregnancy stuff. They're going to talk about their mucus plug, which isn't, you know, listen, it's not disgusting to me. I'm not put off by it, but let these women have a place where they can talk about the things that they do that are important to them without you being there and stifling their conversation. You know, don't go to the baby shower. Don't go to the baby shower. Show up at the end, thank everybody for the gifts, thank the hostess for hosting the baby shower for your your wife, and, and then move on. Guys, don't invade their place. I posted a question about how long should a wedding engagement be? How long should people date before the engagement? Uh, should you get a credit check? Here's one that I got a little pushback on. Should you get a credit check on fiance, your fiance? Am I, the choices were, yes, I should have already done it, or two, no, I prefer to be surprised by her collections agents. 
Yeah. Cam Johnson says the quiz went fast a couple times. I flipped to the next question just as you were about to vote. Well, you can go back and, and vote. There's my daughter. Riley, do you want to jump in here? We're talking about my Instagram quiz, story quiz. Should you ask her father for her hand in marriage? Should you? What do you guys think? Uh, one, A, A, no, he divorced her mom. Or B, yes, he stuck around. Well, clearly it's. You know, my, my daughter says I'm insane. I'm not insane. The world's insane. I'm the same as I've always been. I ask questions about how much debt is too much in a fiance. I call it a, a debt. Debt in a fiance is negative dowry. Negative dowry where they come with a bill instead of cash. How much of that is too much? Uh, ask a question about is it okay? Is it okay to have a girls' night or boys' night after engagement? And of course, the answer to that is no, it's not. Um, of course, I had a third of the people that responded said it was. How about this? Prenups. Prenups okay for first marriages? 31% of people said yes. Would your baby shower argument hang on the difference between celebrating the arrival of a baby versus a coming of age rite of passage for the young woman? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not talking about any differences between... Now, the baby shower is not a celebration of the arrival of a baby. That's not what a baby shower is. A baby shower is a party that a lady's friends have for her to help her obtain all of the things that she needs to take care of the baby. It's not a celebration of the arrival of the baby. You shower the mother with gifts. Shower, that's what they call it, so that um, they don't go broke buying all the stuff you need to have to deal with the baby. Uh, I don't know what, what coming, I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. A coming of age rite of passage for young women, what would that be? A bat mitzvah? We don't do that stuff around here. I, so I don't know. I don't even know what that would be. I don't even know what that would be. Did boomers tell you anything about relationships that was true? Forty-two percent of said yes. That's probably right. That's probably right. I said anything. So even the the blind squirrel finds the nut sometimes, right? All Otterskin says, I was engaged for a time. The student debt that she was carrying, plus her desire to travel, scared the shit out of me. Yeah, did you break it off? You said you were engaged for a time. I was too, but then we got married. So I guess you were engaged for a time and then broke it off. By the way, travel. Travel is a... Um, most travel is covetousness. You go somewhere, you see what these other people have, you partake in it. Um, you know, the desire to go travel is covetousness. You know, and it and it reduces our satisfaction with where we are. Now, somebody in here, some some midwit is going to say, "Oh, you know, my year abroad, you know, made me appreciate home more." Well, maybe if you went to Mogadishu or something, but you know, I've I've traveled. And then I go to the grocery store here, and I'm like, why the hell can't I get clotted cream? I shouldn't even know clotted cream exists. You know? Most, most travel is covetousness. Most watching television is covetousness. <clears throat> Hot take there. Is Rollo a boomer? Sometimes, though, I mean, demographically, Rollo Tomasi probably is a boomer. I don't know when he was born. Um... But I think he's, because of his cynicism, um, his cynicism and his attitudes and his red pill attitude, um, he is an honorary, he is an honorary Gen Xer. He's an honorary Gen Xer. Uh, Otterskin says that he did break off the engagement. There were several big issues that I chose to ignore for too long. But by the grace of God, any mother's tears, he wised up. Good. So I suppose that your mother helped out there, which is awesome. 
WTP says, my wife and I were married, no, we're together 10 years before we got married and had our first kid. The biggest mistake I've ever made, we should have five kids by now. Right, right. Um, here in my quiz, I said, what's the boomer's favorite thing? Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band or No Fault Divorce? Well, 73% of you said it was No Fault Divorce. And then here's the good part. I said, share the horrible boomer advice that you've gotten. And if you guys have some horrible boomer advice that you've gotten, uh, pipe up here in the comments, here in this Instagram Live. This is also going to go out as a Scott Stream podcast, but pipe up in here and we'll talk about it. Here's one that somebody said was horrible boomer advice. The wife should always be available to please the husband. We've already talked about this. And I said, that's actually true. Congrats, you have a good boomer. So not everything they say is wrong. And of course, you know, words like always, you know, the wife should always be available to please the husband. Well, sometimes the wife has an appendectomy. Um, sometimes the wife has a 104 temperature. Sometimes um, food poisoning, whatever. I get it. Always is a big term. But in general, yeah, both spouses should be available to please the other. Come on. You know, why the, why the fuck has it become popular to believe that particularly the wife doesn't have to be available to please their spouse? Now, don't be dirty about this. Don't, you know, please. I mean, why, does, why would anybody think that it would be okay to not to be pleasant and pleasing and to meet the needs of their spouse? You know, what, what, why would anybody not consent to be that way? It's ridiculous. But that's one of the reasons that divorce is so prevalent and why modernity sucks and why there's a men going their own way, MGTOW movement, where they don't even want to get married. Why would they want to? You know, legions of women proclaim loudly that they are not interested in being pleasing to their spouse. Otterskin says, it didn't make the process any easier. Oh, your mother helping getting out of that, uh, out of that, uh, that bad engagement. Blade of Andril, Andril. Says, worst boomer advice. Court a girl until your late 20s, then get married and have kids. So he got married at 21 and celebrate 13 years uh, in May. Good for you, man. Good. Good for you. You know, m mess around, date around in, in your 20s, which means just like rack up a body count and resentments and all this and scar tissue. Uh, and then get married at 30 and have a Downs kid because your, your wife's eggs are old. It's ridiculous. Tyler Turning, Turner shooting says, consider that the central theme of Everybody Loves Raymond is the wife withholding sex for Raymond. Right, and everybody thinks that's funny. It's not funny. When you get married, you make a covenant and a pledge to meet the other people's needs and to not commit adultery, to not obtain intimacy from outside of the marriage. Because you've made that commitment, the flip side of that commitment is for the other person to meet those needs for intimacy so that it's not even a temptation whatsoever to commit adultery. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Guys, as my wife's boyfriend says I'm wrong for expecting her to be available. Wayne Scott says, don't wait to get married. Don't wait to have kids. Get on with it. Grow up. I agree with that. I agree with that. Here's one. I'm going to be crude on this one because the comments are crude. Married the first one you fuck. I said, correct. You also had a rare, helpful boomer. Of course, their phrasing's wrong, right? It's like, don't do that till you get married. Don't do that till you get married. But uh, you shouldn't rack up a huge body count, or any body count, for that matter. Clearly. That's the word. Clearly. But, you know, <clears throat> if people are getting married young, this isn't really a big problem. The problem was when you have, you know, biology, but then society and boomers are telling you that you shouldn't get married till you're 30. 
your, your hormones in your body and biology will drive you crazy. I mean, it will literally break your brain. It's ridic ridiculous. Uh, here's one uh, where I asked, share the horrible boomer advice you've gotten. And the, 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 the response was, the woman is only useful in the kitchen. And I said, uh, also useful for holding flashlights, childbirth, etc. Wayne Scott says, don't screw someone unless you're willing to marry them. Well, here's what I've told my children. If that kind of intimacy is imminent, then um, uh, that's your sign that it's probably time to get married. So, uh, you know, take that as a sign that, 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 uh, that, yeah, that it's time to get married. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the right person to be married to, right? Your urges and your reason might conflict with that. So, but it's, uh, 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 it's incumbent on us to, you know, to discern the difference between our reason and our urges and then, you know, to make the right decision. Here's another one. Share the horrible boomer advice you've gotten. Leaving my government job to work with my boyfriend in a small business would ruin my life, it says. I said, horrible take. Horrible take, bad boomer. Leave your government job to work in small business with, now, I know who this was, and she's sweet, and I like her very much. I know who this was that left this comment. It would have been better if she left her government job to work with her fiance in the small business uh, and then move on, because <clears throat> it's a big ask to ask someone to quit their government job with their pension and their health care insurance and so on when you're not in, at least engaged if, and not or married. That was a big ask, but... Uh, it's working out for them. I happen to know that they're getting married soon, and I'm very happy for them. We like this pipe again. Janice says, I agree. <laughs> well, you tell that one you've got over there. Share the humor, a horrible boomer advice you've gotten. Here's the advice. Work hard at your job. Go the extra mile. They'll take care of you. And I said, partially correct. Work hard, go the extra mile, but no one is going to take care of you. You work hard and you go the extra mile because it's the right thing to do. Because it's the right thing to do. And you'll learn from doing it, and you'll be better off um, by doing so. But no one is going to take care of you. Oh, this is a good one. Somewhat of a spook says, the girl I see, I'm seeing mentioned that after her dad died, she coped with it by racking up a body count. Do I stop seeing her? I'm number 20 on the list. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> uh, there's an enormous amount of evidence, you know, scientific evidence, whatever that means. There's a lot of evidence that shows that, um, well, there is a correlation between body count and the divorce rate. When the body count is over, you can go look this up. When the number of previous partners they've had is over seven, I think the divorce rate is like is in excess of eighty percent. Um, um, virgin marriages, the the divorce rate is like I can't remember. It's very low, ten or twelve percent. It's very low. So your chances of ha that being that being a successful marriage are very very poor. Also, it is proven that. People with those ladies with high, high, high body counts like that have difficulty pair bonding. Um, sex creates, sex causes release of certain hormones that are similar and, and in some cases identical to the hormones that, that young mothers experience when they see their baby. Women with high body counts have trouble bonding with infants, with their infants. There are studies that show, you can go look this up. If you ask me for sources, I'll block you. Go Google it, all right? But there are studies that show that uh, women with high body counts have a harder time recognizing their child's cry and stuff like that. So they tend to be neglectful mothers and, uh, and a high divorce rate. 
you might care about her. Uh, she could be very fine in many, many ways, but she has done some things that that are going to would be a challenge for you for the rest of your life. CMA says you're number 20 and you won't be the last. That's probably the case. That's probably the case. Otter skin says, sorry to be dense, body count. Body count means, the, in the pickup world, they used to call it notch count. How many previous sexual partners have they had? <clears throat> yeah. I'm sorry about that. Dump her. Dump her. Somewhat of a spook. You don't eat 20. Good Lord. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's slut shaming. Listen, how many bad decisions does somebody have to make to have a body count of 20? How many, how many of those guys does she actually know their name? How many of those guys did she have encounters with that were in dangerous situations? Like, the lapses of judgment that are represented by that is just astounding. <clears throat> astounding. And she's 22. She's 22? Good Lord. Do I have a link from CNN to prove that? <clears throat> if I didn't love w WTP extra, I'd have to block him. Oh, I love him, so it's okay. It, yeah. 22 with a body count of 20. Listen, you need to do some soul searching and figure out why you're dating her. Like, what in the world is wrong with you that would have such that you would have continued to give this time and attention? Why? Kappa 2033 says, do you think body count is an issue for men in the same way? It is, it is an issue for men, but not in the same way. It's only been three weeks. Oh, dumper. Holy crap. That, dude, I got shit in the refrigerator that's three months old. You don't... No, dump her. Dump her. Dump her. Good God. Good Lord, dump her. Tell her, hey, uh, it's been a delight, but I am no longer interested in dating you. Um, I'm not going to offer you any explanations, and this isn't uh, negotiable, and I'm blocking your number, and you should block mine as well. Best of luck to you in all things in the future. And by the way, you can do it in text messages. You don't owe her a face-to-face -face on that. You do not owe her a face-to-face -face on that. <clears throat> uh, but back to that, do I think the body count is an issue for men in the same way? Not in the same way. It is an issue, but... Um, men don't seem to have troubles uh, bonding with uh, kind and feminine wives. Uh, if they have a higher body count, there doesn't seem to be the same issues with bonding with their kids. There are other issues. It's just not a virtuous thing to do. And uh, Socrates tells us when we act in, in, with, in, in virtuous ways, it leaves scars on the soul. And I believe that's, I believe that's true. A test of a good girl, CMA says is how far she's willing to go sexually early on the relationship. She shouldn't be giving up the goods like a fire sale. Well, CMA, I don't know, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Attraction is mighty powerful. Attraction is mighty powerful. And if the attraction's there, if the attraction's there, they are, um, well, if the attraction's there, it's game on. Kirk Serber says, does genuine remorse and evidence of a serious change in behavior patterns affect that calculation? No. It's biochemical. The pair bonding problem is a biochemical problem. Is a, is a biochemical problem. You know, repentance is good, right? Repentance is good. It's important to not hate her. It's not. It's important to not punish her, but it's also important to realize to realize that the, the repentance may be there and the penance may be there. That there are long-lasting effects of that that uh, that uh, continue to have consequences, right? 
restraint is important. Sure. It is important, but, and the people are not going to understand this because a lot of you guys haven't been in this situation. If you are a high value male, if you are a charismatic, high value male, and probably a lot of women, well, of course, not a lot of women don't follow me, but a lot of women that follow me are going to think this is ridiculous. But I know it's not, I know it's true. If you are a high value, charismatic male, the attraction can be so, such that um, the right woman will have no restraint when they're with you. You, and that's because they identify you as a proper mate. So that, that restraint thing can be a problem, right? It could be, it could be a sign um, that you're dealing with somebody who has less moral fiber than you would like. It could also mean that the attraction is there and, uh, and that you have been chosen, okay? You have to be real careful. You have to be real careful, um, but you know, I don't know. Kappa says, do you think the alpha widow idea is a good explanation of the issue with the body count? The alpha widow idea doesn't normally explain the body count, but that does explain the phenomenon that the man who marries the high body count woman has to deal with. Yeah. Otter Skin says, I'm reading The Godfather right now. I'm not sure that I like it very much, but the description of the thunderbolt of attraction is pretty interesting. I've never read The Godfather. I don't know what that, what that is, but uh, that thunderbolt of extraction, of, uh, of, I'm sorry, of attraction is pretty real. Hamlet and Ophelia, basically. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Romeo and Juliet happens. It happens. Everybody that met Helen. You know. um, here's one. Keep those comments coming. This is great fun. Share the horrible boomer advice you've gotten. Here's one. Happy wife, happy life. And uh, I wrote horrible life ruining stuff. We cannot make others happy. We're not res we're not responsible for other people's happiness. We're not. We can certainly make people unhappy. Don't do that. But you have to realize that you pro you can't make someone happy. There are some people who just aren't happy. And if you try, um, if you just try to please that person, um, now we talked about being pleasing earlier. But some people can't be pleased, you understand. So if you're dealing with somebody who's darkly depressed, who's unreasonable, who is narcissistic, um, who's damaged, who's an alcoholic, I mean, I could go on and on and on, you're not gonna be able to make that person that person uh, happy. So you, know, you act out of virtue and you act out of concern for that person um, and it is up to them to be happy. But you can certainly certainly cause them to be unhappy and you should never cause the unhappiness on purpose. I've certainly caused some unhappiness but not on not on purpose. He uh Hamlet and Ophelia. She only slept with him because he said he'd marry her, but because she gave it up he dumped her. Yeah, yeah, that's on him. Tyler Turner says, I've heard people advocate for religious marriage ceremonies without getting government married. License, thoughts? Oh, that's some libertarian, ridiculous, stupid garbage. Stupid garbage. Go get married and have the marriage sacrament. Do it properly in your proper church, your proper church with apostolic succession, and then go file with the government. Guys, the marriage license doesn't Look, look, your marriage is going to be governed by the rules of the, of the family court even if you don't go get the marriage license. They have a common law marriage. But the marriage license makes things so very simple. The marriage license de facto lets, is a de, de facto um, power of attorney for medical and financial purposes and is just a shortcut to 
doing business as a couple. You know, that, that whole idea, that, that, that's, that stuff about not letting the government be involved in your romantic decisions is absolutely stupid. Absolutely stupid. The government's involved anyway. If you're with that person for a certain number of years and you commingle your finances, you're going to be a common law marriage and you are going to go to court anyway. Right? If you get divorced. So go get married, go file the paperwork, and use that marriage license to uh, ease your transition into married life. Only polygamists get relig religiously married without being civilly married, is, is what one of the guys says. That's funny. Uh, Blade of Andrew says, as Scott's favorite libertarian, get the dumb license. We can complain about the need for it later. No, we actually need it. Like, even in, even in an anarcho-capitalist society, you would probably need it, right? Uh, if, you don't, if you don't have a marriage license, you would have to have powers of attorney for financial purposes, medical purposes, and so on, that you would have to pay an attorney for, or at least buy, you know, court-tested documents and execute those. You'd have to carry around a fucking file folder to go buy a car with a, with a joint title. You know, so it's a shorthand that's very convenient and should exist even under the most just and minimalist of governments. Tyler heard this from his poli sci -fi professor who was a bit of a nut. Yeah, I get it. I heard that. Um, the state has an interest or should in the institution of marriage. The family is the basic unit of a strong society. It used to be. It is. Well, it is. I agree. Uh, where did you see the marital debt thing that you posted? It's all over the, it's all over, you know, true religion. It's all over Orthodox and Catholic, Orthodox and Catholic Church. Um, where did I see that marital debt? I mean, that concept is not my own. <clears throat> I've held that for a long time, and then I later on find, found out that St. Thomas Aquinas describes the marital debt. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's for real. Um, so you can re go read Aquinas on the marital debt. Don't give the government any ideas on marriage, LMAO. I don't know what that means. Yeah, here's another, here's another bad piece of boomer advice. It's okay to get divorced if you're not feeling it anymore. So I said, what precisely is it, bad boomer? We took a vow. Also, the kids don't care if you're feeling it. All they know is mommy has a new friend she wrestles with after Carson goes off the air. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. You're, if you, you're, you're married. You should all, uh, here's, here's one. Uh, Matt Rogers says, I looked up marital debt on Wikipedia. There's a short injury entry. Don't use Wikipedia anymore. Use Info Galactic. Info Galactic. You should always owe something on a line of credit to help your credit score. I wrote, broke boomer. I hate this one. Our credit score isn't a financial end. We manage our, manage our finances to increase the equity line on our personal balance sheet, period. And if you do that, if you do that, uh, the credit score will be fine. You know, my credit score is probably, I have no idea what it is. It's probably not very good, but if I took my balance sheet to any bank, um, I could borrow anything I wanted. It's, it would be fine. It would be fine. The credit score is a scam. Till disinterest do us part. Yeah, exactly. That's the boomer take. Hey, somebody here is like, oh, if your credit score is better, you get better interest rates. Listen, how do you get a good credit score? How do you get a good credit score? You do it by managing your finances. Manage your finances properly and you'll have the credit score. Don't try to game the credit score and damage your finances. Manage the finances properly and the credit score will follow. So tired of that stuff. Here's one. Date a lot before marriage. Um, I, think you should, I think you should be quick to date and also quick to dump. So, you know, maybe, maybe go on a lot of coffee dates with a lot of people. Um, and you're because you're interviewing and you're auditioning constantly 
Um, so, you know, be quick to date and quick to dump. Um, but, and always date with marriage as the goal, you know. Escalate commitment all the way along. And as soon as somebody shows themselves to be unsuitable for marriage, dump them. You know, dump them immediately. So escalate that commitment mm -hmm. until you either get dump them or you, you're married. Um, so I don't necessarily disagree with this, but I wrote here, you know, when, if a boomer says date a lot before marriage, uh, I can translate that for you. That what that means is your mom was a slut when, before we married. That's what that means. So we don't want that part. Expecting monogamy. Here, Eric says, expecting a monogamy without being available is disgusting. Right, that's what the marital doubt's about. If you expect monogamy, and but yet you're not available. Yeah. Someone of the spook says, why haven't all my guy friends went on a date in years, but all the women your age are seeing four guys at the same time? Hmm, why do you think that is? Give me a, what you think is a plausible answer for that, and we'll talk about it some more. Here's another boomer lie. There is good debt and bad debt. I actually, I don't think that that's a bad one. I wrote, uh, this is a rare nuanced take from a nuanced boomer. It's partially correct. There is, uh, there is money that is wisely borrowed and money that is foolishly borrowed. Um, it's potentially wise to borrow money if you have a promise, not a promise, but if you have a more than reasonable expectation that you'll capture a return by borrowing that money. For example, you know, you may have to borrow some money to buy an expensive machine tool to serve your best and long, most long-standing client, for example. That would be okay to borrow money, I think, to do that. I think that would, that's okay to do that. Buying, borrowing money to buy an RV is not okay. So, you know, debt is not necessarily, is not categorically bad, maybe, maybe. I'm a little conflicted about this because I do have problems with usury. Um, and there have been prohibit, prohibitions on usury through almost all of history, so I'm a little conflicted about it. But, <clears throat> but under the current conditions and where I'm at today, I would say that some debt is okay if you do it for business purposes when you expect to, you expect to, um, net a return. You also, you know, in the modern era, you probably will not be able to buy a home without debt. And it's important for you to own a home. It's important for your family. Dating apps are degenerate. Why, yes, they are. Um, so is that is that your answer why the women are seeing four guys at the same time? Otterskin says this needs to be a Scott, Scott stream. I'll do it. I'll put, uh, if I can capture the audio off of this, I will do it. Sometimes I'm not able to do that. <clears throat> Dating apps are part of it, but the, the, the real problem is probably, the real problem is a concatenation. It's a combination of several factors. The birth control pill, uh, the birth control pill, no fault divorce, Roe versus Wade and uh, feminism. Um, Rollo Tomasi says that um, sperm is plentiful and eggs are rare, and that's true. And over time, that has meant that means that women are pursued more than men are. Men are expendable. They're expendable on the battlefield. Men are the ones that go to confront the, the intruder in the middle of the night, or the ones that get on the roof and in the crawl space. You know, we're the ones that uh, have the dirty jobs and the dangerous jobs. Men are expendable and women are not. And if uh, all of the traditional, um, traditional, and not just traditional, but biological breaks and balances in that relationship between men and women are broken, then you end up, um, you end up with that imbalance where these women are dating four guys at a time and the men aren't dating anybody. And the dummies right now are saying, oh, well, how can that be that they're dating four men? That means that these guys, no, listen, you can go look at data that was released by Tinder and eHarmony and so on, and you can see that I think it's around the top 5% of male profiles 
are getting all of the matches. The explanation I always give is that when I was in high school, almost 40 years ago, 35 years ago, everybody was pretty much monogamous. It was kind of, to be fair, it was like serial monogamy, but it was mostly monogamous. And what that meant was, is that the head cheerleader dated the captain of the football team. Well, now they're monogamous and they're not available. Well, now the co-captain and, the, uh, and the, the, the second most desirable cheerleader, they date. Now they're off of, the, off of the board. And so now the eights are dating, right? And then you get down to uh, the sevens and the sixes. And then there's a dude who's you know pretty average, but he's a nice guy. And he dates an average girl who's a nice girl. They're fives, and now they're monogamous. Right on down the line to the point you have somebody that's like disfigured dating some guy that's pretty pretty pathetic but everybody gets to have a partner when it's monogamous you break that and what you end up with when there's no monogamy is that at closing time every now and then a six will get taken home by a nine every now and then if there's no monogamy and everybody's promiscuous a, a dude who's a nine will bring a six home. Now, she will think that she's beautiful at any size. One time a nine took me home. I'm not settling for a six. That's what that means. So now her, her peers are out of business. That's what's happened. There is a, uh, Otterskin says, thank you for the prayers for your uncle. You're welcome. Uh, you're welcome. I'm sorry for, for him being gone. Eric says, there's a vested interest in encouraging women to not rely on just one person. Hmm. Visual Sophistry says, look up the masculinist. Here's an entire newsletter edition about the online dating skewing heavily the top 5% of men. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's not even, yeah, that's not even debatable. It's terrible. Here's some, uh, here's a stupid line that a boomer gave someone said, my wife's grandma gave me a bell to ring if I didn't feel well. I rang it once. And I said, stupid boomers. For some reason, boomers think that it's funny to make these jokes about grouchy and abusive wives and their like rolling pins and their frying pans and all this stuff. Um, it's not funny. It's not funny. And you only ring it once. If you don't feel well, if you're sick, ring the bell. Right? And I wrote here, get the bell and ring it for help if you need it. If she rings it, go to her and help her. We are married to help each other cheerfully and lovingly. Like this whole idea that it's funny for these women to frankly be abusive. I only rang it once. Well, that implication is that she, uh, you know, screamed at him, made him miserable, whatever. It's, it's, not, it's not funny. Most domestic violence is initiated by women. Go look it up. It's not funny. Uh, share the horrible boomer advice you've gotten. Um, anything involving personal finance. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I, I think that's true. Boomers are mostly wrong about personal finance. They've lived through a huge stock market run up and they think that everything's going to get better and better and better and and their parents grew up during the great depression and the boomers did and as a result the the, the, the folks that grew up there in the great depression learned a lot about thrift about not wasting things about gratitude and the boomers rather than learn that take those lessons from the the depression generation reacted to it and that may be the worst thing that they've done, is they've reacted to their upbringing instead of incorporating it. It's astounding to me. Like, why, why did that generation react to and reject their upbringing and that tradition rather than embrace it? I'm not sure that we can point to very many times in history where that has happened in such a wholesale way. 
I don't understand it. Uh, here's one, here's some dumb boomer advice. Wait until after college to get married because you have to get a college degree. Um, <clears throat> I ran into a version of this earlier, uh, earlier this month <clears throat> from a boomer. You often hear this from boomers, right? Wait until after college and after you get established in your career before you get married. These people fundamentally misunderstand the human person. M marriage and family is not a distraction. I moved in close for you podcast people. I moved in close to the mic. Marriage and family is not a distraction. It is a motivation. When you understand that those things are motivational, then you understand that that people need them. So when you find a good one and you can support yourselves, get married and work on the project together. The project is live. Work on that together. That is in those you know, marriage and family is in motivation. It is not a distraction. Uh, here's one. My dad's favorite is do as I say, not as I do. It's a sad boomer. Dad, you need to do as you say because the world's watching you. And we know. You know people, people are upset with these boomers and tired of it. People are upset with them and tired of it. We know. And their legacy is going to be terrible. I'm going to drink a little water here. Bring your comments. Tap water, even. What else here? We got any more dumb boomer reactions to my post here? A lot of the boomers just can't, they can't leave my comments alone. And they just, they're terrible. Let's see here. Yeah, here's the next one. That, the, Share the horrible boomer advice you've gotten. That whatever doctors you have are the best doctors. <laughs> well, that's sort of an attitude, right? Like if you talk to boomers and you say, oh, um, I had a cyst removed. They'll always ask, well, who's your doctor? And, they, and you, you name your doctor and they never know who it is. They, they do that all the time. But they never know who the doctor is. I don't know why they do that. But they, they want they want to they want to talk about doctors. They want to believe that their doctor's the best doctor. If for some reason you say, "Oh, uh, I went and got my PSA checked," and they say, "Well, who's your doctor?" and you you name their doctor, oh, they're infinitely pleased that you went to their doctor. Uh, because all boomers are techno boomers. They're all progressive technologists. They they saw the moon landing on television. And if they see a lab coat, they think scientists, they think moon landing, and this is highly simplified, but they, they just have an implicit and complete trust in the trappings of science. And, and I'm telling you right now, healthcare quality is declining in the United States. Um, if you haven't noticed it yet, you will notice it now that I've said this. And five years from now, you're going to say Hamburg was right about it. I promise you, healthcare quality in the United States is falling. Life expectancies are falling, and they're going to fall precipitously. And this is what you get when you import the world. And this is what you get when you destroy your schools. I promise you. <clears throat> Tyler Turner excuse me, says, when is the bill coming due for boomer spending and their Social Security and Medicare? Is there any future in which we don't have massive tax increases? The bill is coming due right now. They are printing money. They're going to continue to print money. They're pro I don't know if they're going to be massive tax increases, but it doesn't matter. If they don't increase the taxes, they will meet those obligations by printing money, which is a silent tax. Uh, it is coming due right now, and it is going to continue to come due, and we've got a balloon payment coming in the future. Yeah. But here, here's a hot take from Matt. Matt. It says, it's just like Mark Twain in, uh, in the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. It's a self-insert fan fiction jerking off to science. 
Yeah, I have said on podcasts and in other places that the Edwardians may have been the worst, worse than the Boomers, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, here's one. Here's some good advice that somebody thought was bad advice: was save money by not going on vacation. And then this person says, the best experiences of my life were these vacations are well worth every penny. And I said, this boomer was correct. Vacations are enormously expensive, and they're not the only kind of experience that's available. You know, you could just as easily have had a much cheaper best experience of your life. You know, you could, instead of taking that vacation and spending all that money to go to Spain and gawk at those people on the Iberian Peninsula like it was a zoo exhibit, like Spain and you know, fill in the blank. Wherever it is that you wanna go, doesn't exist for you to gawk at. Those people are living their life and they're living their purpose inside their own context. It's not for you to gawk at, and not for you to covet. You know, find a way to live inside your context and find a way to be happy there and live that. You know, quit going to go find yourself by going abroad. Knock that shit off. It's covetousness, and it will only serve to make you less happy with what you have and where you are. You know, so instead of going on vacation, you know, plan a big family reunion or something. Uh, you know, start a book group, right? Take some chess lessons or some of the things I said. Uh, travel is covetousness. I've said it. You've never been to Spain, but kind of like the music. That's what uh, Hoyt Axton from Oklahoma says. Uh, here's one horrible boomer advice. You won't get to walk around with a calculator your whole life. And uh, I said, yeah, Hoyt Axton wrote that song, not Three Dog Nine. Typical boomer uh, comment there, oh, you won't get to walk around with a calculator your whole life. And uh, that's true. Until it wasn't true, because now we all have both calculators in our pockets because they're in our iPhones. But here's, but see, the boomers don't understand that that was never the point, right? They should have said, listen, you have to master the basics in order to exhibit excellence. You know, learn the multiplication tables. Get good at arithmetic. That will serve you for the rest of your life. It will be a foundation for excellence in all things that you do. But instead, they make this comment about, you know, technology, and they just make this flippant comment about, that, that's really snide and sarcastic, actually. And, and, and so instead of speaking to excellence and virtue, they make a flippant comment about, oh, well, you're not going to have, you know, you have it easier than we did. We didn't have calculators. We had to use a slide rule, so you shouldn't use a calculator because we had it so hard and we used a slide rule. You're not going to have that with you anyway, every, all the time, so you need to No. We do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. They don't have a concept of that, so they can never speak to it. It's all about resentment because they didn't have a calculator when they went to school. They walked uphill in the snow, right? Driving to Colorado Springs and walking through the Garden of the Gods is incredible. The whole trip was fairly cheap. Sure. The best dollars I ever spent were dollars I didn't spend, Texas Pete says. Could be. Here's some. Boomer says, date for at least 12 months. That was said by a lady on her third marriage. And I said, the problem wasn't the evaluation, period. It's the evaluator. What were her, what were her, what were her criteria for evaluating this maid? Hmm? What are her, what are her criteria? What, are, what me needs is she trying to get met through being married? You know, are her expectations unreasonable? Uh, is she just in it for a good time? I don't know, but you know, don't be casual when you date. It's the most, one of the most serious things that you'll ever do. And if you're not casual about it and you're deadly serious about it, it won't take that long. It won't take, it won't take 12 months. Figure it out, be quick to date, be quick to dump, always be escalating and you'll keep going. Here's one, you can be a self-made man Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't like that whole idea about the self-made man. I kind of get. I understand what they're talking about. Um, 
But I, I would say, you know, again, I need to tell you, life is up to you, son. Um, no one can do it for you. Your mom and I are here to help, but ultimately you're on your own. That's important to tell them. Um, but they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't couch things in that kind of language. Dee Dee Zen says, few minutes past this point, but I'll throw it out anyway. It really impacted the way I valued my fiance. Wendell Berry said about his wife, I work along, alone, but always with her presence in mind, and she is somebody I want to impress. I'm going to write this with the hope that it will help her love me. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I, I, think I, I think I share the same sort of attitude and always have. I just wouldn't be as clever as to be able to write it that way. Yeah, Zach says, you're going to go out on a limb and say that this woman's compatibility issues were internal. Of course they were. Here's one. Share the horrible boomer advice you've gotten. Never go to bed angry. And um, I don't think that's a bad piece of advice. We've got to be careful with it, though. It's just an aphorism, so we've got to be careful with it. Like, what does it mean? And I, I say, you know, it's impossible to never go to bed angry. Um, but I think it's a pretty good rule. If you and the spouse are having a conflict, you need to resolve those things immediately. And if that means you miss some sleep, um, then miss some sleep. You know, we've had we've had disagreements and, and troubles like all people do. And I've taken off work and missed the next day of work because we were going to, you know, resolve it and commit to resolving it and come up with a compromise that we could live with. And, uh, and also right here, you know, don't go to bed angry. Well, and also, never go sleep on the couch. Never go sleep on the couch. That's the first te- step towards sleeping in an apartment and getting a divorce. Dude, sleeping in the ca- on the couch is giving up. You might be mad as hell, but you lay there next to her and you be mad as hell and you go to sleep and you be an adult. You hear me? Somewhat of a speech says, is there anything I can do to help my 25-year-old friends to start dating again? I don't know. Hey, listen, don't worry about them. You need to go find a mate. You go do a good job, you end up with somebody, and uh, they'll see that and they'll go do something about it. But other than that, don't worry about them. Fuck them. They're all on their own. Matt Rogers says, stand and fight, be quick to ask forgiveness, sleep, and other obligations be damned. I'll take that. I'll take that. I like that. But here, here's one from England. Boomer says, don't buy a house, live in a rented house owned by your local council forever. I wrote the Brit boomers are probably the worst boomers, and I think that's probably true. Uh, here's another one. Marry your best friend. That's super stupid. Spouses aren't friends and friends aren't spouses. They're two different things. Um, The requirements that we have on a spouse are far greater and more important than the ones you would have on a friend. Um, And friends and spouses meet entirely different needs. The idea that you marry your best friend puts you in a position to ultimately not have friends when you're married. And uh, that ain't good. So, you know, don't compare marriage with friendship. They're just not the same thing at all. Uh, Somewhat of a spook says, I wish that my friends were inspired by it. We have another friend that is having twins with his wife. Well, if they're not, listen, don't worry about them. You're not here to save those people. I'm not here to say those people. You take care of yourself, and you know when you get a chance, you know encourage them to date or something. You know introduce them to somebody if you think it's appropriate. But you know if pandas won't breed and that they die out, then that's fine. Matt Rogers once says, "My wife once told me years ago to sleep on the couch, deservedly. I told her no. She slept on the couch for ten minutes and came back to bed. Right." That's that's good, and vice versa. If you, you know, good, and we don't do that. We don't do that. It's the first step towards sleeping in an apartment, and then leaving. 
what else here? Go to college. You know, yeah, we don't even talk about that. That's so dumb. I've talked about that so much. I'm bored with it. Follow your passions and money will follow. And I wrote here that passions are to be regulated, not followed. Passions aren't rational. And, um, yeah, again, go read Aquinas. Go read, go read Aristotle. They're to be regulated, not followed. Here's some more dumb boomer advice. Have fun while in college. You'll have to play by the rules afterwards. College isn't for having fun. You're setting up a foundation for the rest of your life. You know, go build that proper foundation. Yeah. Yeah. College equals success. Yeah. But boomers don't even know what success is. They don't know what the good life is. They can't define those things. Not even for themselves. Not even wrongly. And it's just it's just all consumption, you know? I'm really tired of it. Uh, here's some. Hey, good night, Eric. Good to see you. Um, here's one. In, 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 encouraged uh, a son to enjoy himself at uni and not be tied down. They'll be the best years of your life, he said. Um, I say college would only be the best years of somebody's life if they didn't use those years to build a foundation to build a life on. You know, I know a lot of people that, you know, high school or college were the best years of their life because they didn't use them properly. If you use them properly, it's a springboard into just, you know, a better and better life. Ugh. Otterskin says, I have a coworker who told me once that if she didn't get married by 30, that we should just get married. I laughed at the time, but now shudder to think of the mind that thought that. Well, she rain-checked you, Right? She rain checked you. She's hypergamous. She's like, well, you're a nice guy, Otter Skin, and I'll keep looking for somebody better, but if that doesn't work, and why don't you and I do it? Ha ha. Ha ha. She's actually probably serious. Uh, DD Zen says, in college, being in a relationship made me to go to bed early, stay focused, etc. Yes, being in relationships, being married, Having a family is a motivation. It is not a distraction. Boomers have got everything wrong. You can pretty much look at mainstream boomer thought and realize it's an inversion. Take the opposite and you'll be closer to correct. Ask not for whom the wall comes. It comes for thee. Yeah. Here someone says, all the boomers I know are too busy nursing opioid addictions now and watching TV to give advice. And there's some truth in that too, isn't there? And I said, good, the day of the pillow awaits those people, so that's good. Yeah, here's some, oh yeah, why won't you get the vaccine? Don't you want to travel again? The boomer mother-in-law says. Of course, you know, when I posted that, you know, Instagram says, uh, for information about vaccines, visit cdc.gov. So dumb. Um, I'll just read verbatim what I wrote here in that comment. Uh, the truth is, boomers are afraid you're going to get them killed. Weird proteins in your ovaries and chronic heart inflammation leading to a rash of heart transplants in 10 years will be worth the trip to Costa Rica, says the boomer. And the truth is they just don't care. They want to live forever, and even if that means their children and grandchildren suffer, they don't care. Yeah. They, they think that all of their health problems can be fixed, and that everybody will just act right, and that the doctors will just do their job, that they'll live to be 140. Yeah, uh, more, I'm starting to get some of the same ones, or versions of the same problems, or same advice over and over again. Like, uh, go to university, it's your only option. Uh, but, you know, I don't think they think that's the only option. Members that give that advice don't think that's the only option. Uh, and they don't, they never say it that way, right? Go to the university, it's their only option. They just don't ever, you're, you're just not likely to hear it, any other advice given from them. And I, and I think it's really, I think for them it's mostly about vanity. They just don't want to tell their peers that their son is an HVAC guy or a plumber. They just don't want to go to the club 
the, the country club or whatever, their class reunion, until somebody that they went to school with that their, that their kid is a plumber. There's a bee circling around me. Get away. Yeah, don't have kids until you're 30 so you can enjoy your 20s. Here's one. The 20s are not enjoyable, guys. It's a post-adolescent period. You don't have resources. You don't know what you're doing. You don't have experience. You don't have a network of people. You don't, it, it's, the, the 20s are not enjoyable if you're paying attention. People that enjoy their 20s are probably brain dead and not really paying attention. The 20s exist for you to toil and bust your ass in. Like you're energetic. You're not disillusioned. Um, so many things that we can do pay huge dividends when we're in our 20s. Uh, so devoting your 20s to work and to children is a really great use of those uh, because it's it's just not a it's not a great time. Sorry, and some some asshole was probably saying, well, it's not wasn't a great time for you because you didn't party and do all the stuff I did. No, no, listen. The 20s, if anything great happens to somebody when they're in their 20s, it's like taking a 12-year-old to Ruth Chris, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Like, the steak is good, and the kid will enjoy it, but not like a 40-year-old will enjoy it. You're just not prepared for, you just don't have the perspective, and you're not prepared for, for real joy or appreciation or gratitude in your 20s. You're just not. Nobody is. You can't be. You've only been on the ground for 21 years or something. CMA says, my boomer grandparents get mad when I tell them if I knew what I know now, I wouldn't have gone to college. And I'm going for engineering and succeeding. Overpriced and overvalued. Your boomer grandparents get mad. Well, you know, yeah, they're irrelevant. You know, love them. Go see him, play cards with him or whatever, but, you know, whatever. Whatever. Yeah, CMA says had to spend 20 grand on gin eds alone. Right. Ah. But these, they don't understand that their experience doesn't apply anymore. You know, the, 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 ver the sheer amount of societal change that they helped bring about means that their experiences and their opinions have been rendered irrelevant. You know, what they think about college doesn't matter because they haven't reevaluated re that since they went to college. You know, this very change and quote unquote progress that they wanted and have ushered in at every, chain, at every chance has rendered them irrelevant and resented. Now, I think all of us kind of unplug from and are less dialed into pop culture as we get older, but but they have a sort of arrogance about their opinions that I don't see in other generations, where they will argue, you'll be in college, or a new graduate from college, paying the debt, paying the price, interviewing for the first jobs, seeing what they pay, knowing what the, the debt payments are going to be. And you can tell them, well, you wish you hadn't done it. And they will argue with about, you about it based on an experience they had in the 60s. The arrogance is astounding. Zach says, you've got no frame of reference. You've got to eat a lot of bad Applebee steaks to truly appreciate the uh, Ruth's Chris steak. Yeah, I think that's true. Somewhat of a spook says, my boomer aunt took my 95-year-old grandpa on a bus trip to an aviary two hours away and then got off at a bus station. She called my dad to come pick them up right then and there. Huh. I don't know what all that means. Uh, here's some boomer advice that someone got. It says, uh, I was told to not talk about personal finance with other people. And I said, um, yeah, and I, I, I've heard them say that. Um, boomers are so envious and judgmental that they can't imagine people talking about personal finance 
and not being envious about it or being judgmental about it, um, and then gossiping. They're projecting there. They're so distasteful, they can't imagine that you could talk about it in a spirit of trying to be helpful to each other and sharing knowledge and trying to improve each other because they are such social climbing, grasping uh, people. Visual Sophistry says, I'm only 36 and my opinions are probably irrelevant at this point. I at least got a chance to grow up without social media. Right. Visual Sophistry said, I told my wife we won't be able to offer our daughter any relevant dating advice. None. Maybe. Maybe. I hope you can. I think that we have a chance. I think we have a chance for things to get a little bit better. Somewhat of a spook says, I can't be wheeling around 95 year olds for hours in 103 degree heat. Yeah. Plastics. Go into plastics. Yeah. Now, now, the, now the words are, you know, get into computers or finance and it's all fake and gay. It's all going to crumble and um, the people that have been in those areas are going to be wrecked. Here's one. Marriage is about keeping the wife happy. Boomer cuck. Yeah, so th those are some of those comments I got, I got today. It's been very interesting. Um, it's fascinating to me that, uh, yeah, STEM. Go into STEM. Oh, go into STEM. You know, science, technology, engineering, medicine. That's the future. Whatever. Yeah, and then the, until that gets offshore as well, right? But, right. So I'll probably have some people push back with, at me on these and argue with me, uh, a bunch of stupid moderns, and I'll just block them, you know. And then they'll then they'll be somewhere on Reddit saying Hambrick just wants to live in a in an echo chamber, you know. I don't agree with a lot of people about a lot of things. There's a whole spectrum of agreement that's available uh, without being in an echo chamber. Like servers in here, and I, every time I talk to him, they get in an argument. I don't agree with him about anything, but I love him, but we're not enemies. But if you're a, a mindless modern who is uh, completely worried about, uh, completely worried about uh, a wife's consent, then uh, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. Uh, Campus is a trend to offshore STEM right now. They are offshoring STEM right now. You know, there will be um, telemedicine, um, you know, so much of the engineering for Boeing uh, is being done offshore and so on. It, it's, being, it's being offshored right now. It's, yeah, it's happening. Um, we are fucksword. Well, that's all I wanted to rant about today. I'll keep um, I'll keep doing some of these little uh, little quizzes and uh, polls. Those are pretty interesting. I think it's really interesting to hear what people have to say. And of course, the boomers can't stand it. Oh, they just they just oh my god, they just spit out. Oh, my friends don't think those things. Uh, that must be the. I had a lady that said, "Oh, that's the early boomers that talk like that." Let me see. I'll go read her comment. It'll make her. And if I ever read people's comments online. They get so mad, they think they got doxxed. Let's see here. Yeah, Susan says, I'm a late boomer, 1960. Most of your boomerisms are for the first half of the boomer, gener boomer generation. None of my peers believed or said that stuff. That is absolutely ridiculous. The late boomers, the 57 and 1957 birth dates and up, are the worst. The boomers that were born in 65, the year they turned 18, 30% of, I have read, that 30% of the pregnancies ended, ended in abortion. They're the most dissolute, degenerate group of people since the French Revolution, probably. Uh, Otter Skin says, I moonlight as an adjunct professor. You can see the quality drop with the standards, of course. Of course. Zach says, um, Boomer mindset is dangerous. I've seen it kill two marriages recently. It gets me mad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's Generation X people have watched, been watching them destroy these marriages since 70, 1970. Um, it's modernity. 
but you know, pointing this out, you know, people people understand the boomer problem, and pointing this out in terms of boomers really helps us kind of fight this culture war, guys. People understand this. It puts a face on it, which they all understand and can relate to. And then pointing out that if you invert what they have done, you end up with what's real and good and true. That, that, people know that. People know that. It's perfect. Zach says, I'm only 30 something newer to it than you. Well, yeah. They've been doing it for years, man. They've been doing it for years. It's terrible. Hey, welcome. They call me Bubba. Spartan Law says, my parents were born in 61, but they both joined the Air Force right out of high school and avoided most boomer nonsense. I don't know. It sounds to me like your mom was a career person. <clears throat> sounds to me like your mom was a career person. Um, maybe not. Nobody got out of it untouched. Nobody got out of it untouched. You know, my parents were born, my parents are very early boomers. Um, I mean, right after World War, World War II. I mean, 46. And they were in Oklahoma, which was not a progressive place. And so they missed a lot of it. But they do have a faith in medicine, a faith in science, sort of a faith in the system that, that I don't have. Um, they are frugal. They have been married for 50 years, 51 years. Yes, 55 years. Yeah, 55 years. So that that's very good. Um, but you know that that whole era, none of that era left anybody unhurt, un, un, unharmed. Visual software says, what is our task? I'm coming around to the idea that it's just to prepare the seed bed for the few people who will get burned and see and see through the crap. I don't see any hope of a wider cultural turnaround, at least not soon. No, there will not be a wider cultural turnaround. So it's it's um, um, Yeah, there will not be a wider cultural turnaround. Uh, the Kurgan, there's a blogger, the Kurgan. Uh, talks about how talks about how the Generation X is not the group that's going to save it. Generation X is mostly comprised of really cynical loners. Um, they see all of the problems, but having um, essentially slinked around and avoid try to avoid the wrath of the boomers for all this all, all of their adolescence and and then. Uh, you know, the boomers still won't retire. Like, Generation X should be moving into, you know, upper, uh, you know, into the CEO roles and and um, and uh, <laughs> presidencies and whatever. It's just not happening because they're not relinquishing those those roles. And there's such a huge voting block, whether it's on the whether it's with proxy votes in the uh, in the corporate world or uh, re you know voting in whatever that is in the political world that. You know, X is having a hard time taking those taking those reins, and they won't do it anyway. They're so cynical. I mean, if you think about grunge music, that sort of that sort of brooding character that you see in in that that's that's kind of who they are. So they see the problems, um, they'll grouse about it, um, and they see the reality more clearly than maybe the mamas and the papas. You know than, than than the boomer music people than the boomers do, but they're really not fitted for leadership in most cases. So, and the millennials, the millennials are zombies. Uh, they don't feel things. They don't see the problems. They're the the, the millennials were raised by boomers. Um, Z X Generation X was raised by boomers, and so was the so were the millennials. Um, so were most of the millennials, and uh, um, they, the millennials were laid, were raised mostly by the late boomers, who are the worst of the boomers, and they're zombies. They're an emotional shamble. They, um, 
it's not fair to them. Um, I don't hate them or anything like that. I'm not shitting on them. They've been, as a group, um, have been dealt a very, very raw deal uh, with, with some of the most neglectful and narcissistic parenting in government in the history of the world. And they're just not going to be fitted for leadership or really anything. They are, you know, if they were infants and they would they would die crib death or <laughs> a, a failure to thrive. They are just not thriving in adulthood, and uh, uh, it's going to have to be Generation Z. It's going to have to be the Zoomers, and I I see. I'm more hopeful about them. There are a lot of them that are woke and are just completely garbage people and are going to be completely useless culturally. But uh, but there are some of them that are extraordinarily hip and, and black-pilled and know what's going on, outraged by it, and are gearing up for action and uh, have an enormous amount of resolve. They have no illusions like the millennials do that they were entitled to something or something good would happen. You know, the millennials thought that something good would happen, that they would do what they were told to do, go to college, they would go get a job, they would get a management deal, and they would thrive, and they haven't, but they still had that illusion. Generation Z does not have that illusion. They know it's rough. They know it's rough, and they know why, and they know it's a raw deal. And because they don't have the illusions, they're not going to hold out hope for this. And I think that they're going to act. Not all of them, but but some of them. Zach says, they're not retiring. The boomers aren't retiring because they value their career more than family. So retiring to spend time helping raise grandchildren is a feeling. Yeah, and they don't have grandchildren. And they're divorced, and nobody likes them, and, you know, they're miserable. Visual Sophistry says, I'm 36. My parents were born in 55. Right, your, your parents were boomers. A lot of people have been telling me, oh, the millennials' parents are Generation ZX. That's not true. It's mostly not true. It's mostly not true. Uh, my parents were born in 55. They were good parents overall, but they gave me that same stuff. College, career, never talked to me about marriage and family. And they were the good parents, he says. Right. Right. And he says, yes, we did think that. They thought that... The millennials were told that if they go to college, if they focus on their career, if they wait for marriage, if they wait to have kids, that everything will fall in line and that they will win in life. They were told these are the steps to success. And everything they were told was not true. They were completely misled. And now they're 25 to 35 years old, something like that. And they don't know what to do next. And, and frankly, they're too old to figure it out. As a generation, here and there, some of them will be able to figure out a, a path to, uh, you know, the good life for themselves. But, but uh, the neuroplasticity isn't there. You know, at this point, they're old dogs, and those new tricks are going to come hard for them. And, um, you know, and it's hard for a 36-year-old to outwork a 25-year-old. So this Generation Z is coming up, and they're going to have they're going to they're going to have the energy. So it's going to be interesting. But the millennials were dealt a really, really raw deal. He, uh, yeah, Visual Sophistry says, I lucked into a wife and kids by God's grace, basically, but it was in spite of all the advice I was given. Yeah. 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 Well, guys, this has been fun. It's been long enough. I don't want to go any longer. I want to make sure. I hope that we can get the audio off of this and put this out of the Scott stream. But, uh, uh, thanks much. Go comment on those uh, on his Instagram, on those stories, and uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll we'll keep this up. It's good fun. Uh, thank you guys much for coming, and uh, we'll do it again soon.